kill the last unbeliever who disturb the sleep of your beloved. After Dracula and Frankenstein, The Mummy is the third of the great Hammer franchises. But unlike those others, there's no actor or character to follow through the series. There's no continuity of story. Mythology changes, as do writers and directors. The time period shifts from Victorian through to the early 70s. The last film doesn't even have a mummy. It's a rarity, a film series with no sequels, no prequels, no requels, reboots or spin-offs. It's a thematic franchise. Four films, each with their own take on the same subject. Following the success of Frankenstein and Dracula, Hammer made a deal with Universal to remake their horror classics, starting with The Mummy. The film reunited much of the Frankenstein and Dracula team. Director Terence Fisher, writer Jimmy Sangster, and stars Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee. The biggest change was the producer. He who robs the graves of Egypt dies. Having said that nothing unites the Mummy films, the person who comes closest is producer Michael Carreras. Grandson of one of Hammer's founders and son of its long-standing chairman James Carreras, Michael went into the family business at an early age, but the company's new focus on horror left him cold, preferring spectacle and adventure to the dark gothic. The Mummy gave him a chance to exercise those preferences in a horror film, even adding an additional flashback for more of what he called Egyptology and Razzmatazz. Jimmy Sangster's script cherry-picked elements from the five Universal Mummy films. A love story here. He tried to bring back to life the princess he loved. A swamp there. The character names are mostly from the Mummy's tomb. For 20 years I've been trying to discover the tomb of Ananka. Ancient Egyptian princess Ananka is dug up by archaeologist Stephen Banning who is driven insane, then killed by the tomb's protector, the mummy Karis. His son John and his wife Isabel are then pursued by Egyptian priest Mehemet Bey. Destroy the second of the infidels who dare to desecrate the tomb of your princess. Using Karis to punish the archaeologists. I believe the intruder was a mummy, a living mummy. It's also probably the Universal films that led to Hammer's most famous Egyptological error. I must hand over to you the secret guarded by the high priests of Karnak. Karnak is a place, but Sangster assumed it to be the name of a god, high priest of the god Karnak. Great Karnak, god of all light and darkness. Poor guy's taken a lot of flack for that. But the differences are more interesting than the similarities. Most obviously, colour. The sets don't really convince, but ancient Egypt in colour was still good to see, even if it wasn't exactly the Ten Commandments. Incidentally, although it was never released, Michael Carreras reshot this scene with topless handmaidens. Something he had done before and would do again. She's the best part of my life, she's been spent amongst the dead. Then there were the stars. Peter Cushing's John Banning is more engaging than any of Universal's heroes, but the biggest change is the Be mummy himself. Be without movement. Let them not pass away. The problem all mummy films have is that we want to see a mummy, but the bandaged zombie, stiffened with age, dragging a bum leg behind it, is not that threatening. The Karloff version disposed of it quickly. The Mummy is only on screen for about 30 seconds, while all the sequels are marred by it. Hammer's Karis is a believable threat. Christopher Lee imbues him with a powerful physicality, enhanced by the fact that here, it's the hero with the dodgy leg making Karis seem almost superhuman by comparison, ripping the bars from windows. A scene probably inspired by 1933's The Ghoul, itself inspired by the Universal Mummy. 
and breaking down doors with ease. Actually, not that much ease. The door was mistakenly left locked and Lee nearly dislocated his shoulder. Banning is only saved by the arrival of his wife. Twice. Most synopses say that Isabel Banning is the reincarnation of Princess Ananka, Karis's lost love, as in the 1932 version, and maybe we're meant to think that, but there is nothing in the film to say so. She's been dead 4,000 years. So has the mummy, the comatose state of living death. As far as the script goes, Isabel's similarity to Ananka is an extraordinary coincidence that has taken her husband three years to spot. I never noticed it before, but with your hair like that, you're the image of Ananka. It's a tribute to Hammer that you're enjoying the film too much to notice. This set the pattern for future films. Stories may be inconsistent, but they serve as a base for memorable set pieces. This one suggested by Cushing himself, to explain poster art that came before the script. We, we mustn't cheat the audience. Could I take the harpoon in the study and run it right through old Christopher, and he can just break it off and just carry on regardless? They're also a showcase of fine character actors. Marvellous. Banning Senior is played by Felix Aylmer, a year before he starred in Hammer's disturbing Never Take Sweets from a Stranger because the other half is removed from fact. Raymond Huntley had been the first actor to play Dracula in the West End, so we see one of the first Draculas killed by the most recent. Yvonne Ferno was cramming in a hammer horror in between films for Antonioni and Fellini. I've never ordered you to do anything before, but I'm doing so now. Isabel is a thankless role, but the actress was impressed by the professionalism of Cushing and Lee quickly learning that they took it seriously, so she had better do the same. Hammer's stable of bit players are also in evidence. George Woodbridge, Harold Goodwin. What was on the card? A great ruddy box. And Michael Ripper. Ten foot tall he was, swathed in bandages. As are its crack team behind the scenes. In the tomb, cinematographer Jack Asher sprayed the air with water, so there was no floating dust absolutely undisturbed. Enhancing the sense of a room sealed airtight for centuries. The production design of Bernard Robinson and Margaret Carter is more opulent than a hammer budget should allow, as are the costumes of Molly Arbuthnot. While composer Franz Reisenstein delivered a score that would suit a Hollywood epic. Hammer's mummy has scale and weight. I must ask you to stop these operations. Despite razzmatazz and chopped up universal plots, Hammer's mummy strikes at deeper themes. You are an intruder. That weakness of the English hero is reflective of the end of empire. Made only a few years after the Suez Crisis, the Hammer film leans into Britain's imperial guilt. Why should it trouble me? I'm a civilized man, Mr. Banning. The violence is orchestrated by Mehemet Bey, but he has a legitimate grievance. You force your way in. You remove the remains of the long dead kings and send them to places like the British Museum. The scene in which John Banning deliberately goads him is a tour de force for both Cushing. And Karnak wasn't a particularly important deity. The third rate god. And Cypriot actor George Pastel. Now you talk about something of which you know nothing. Bringing depth and sincerity to what could have been a one note character. I think you will not go unpunished. Punished? But it gets more interesting because Bay is a devotee of Karnak, the same god whom Karis offended, leading to a terrible punishment. more gruesome before editing. He was buried alive in a secret tomb specially prepared for him. Karis is the puppet of his own tormentor, putting a very different complexion on the moment when he breaks free. Kill her, Karis. Kill her! 
turning on his puppeteer. Lee's performance is remarkable, especially his eyes. The rest of his face hidden by Roy Ashton's superb makeup. Killing Stephen Banning, we see the intensity of his hatred, while on seeing Isabel, the torment of 3,000 years is projected. Many of the successes of this film, Hammer would emulate through the franchise, but they forgot that the mummy was a character and required an actor of Lee's caliber. Give life. Give life when I pronounce the mighty word of power. Although his final moments were given over to stuntman Eddie Powell, who nailed this shot in one take, for which Michael Carreras doubled his wages. The finished film was exactly what Carreras had wanted, a romantic boy's own adventure. Entertaining, but still convincing as horror. It was also what Hammer wanted, a hit, with US box office outstripping even Dracula. Lady Mary's moment of triumph. And yet, Hammer didn't return to The Mummy for five years. Part of the reason is probably that it did not suggest an easy sequel, but it's also true that in the early 60s, Hammer was striving for variety within the horror genre. Frankenstein went six years without a second sequel, and Christopher Lee spent eight years away from Dracula. Instead, Hammer revisited universal classics and explored new horror territory. They made historical swashbucklers, contemporary thrillers, and disturbing dramas. It was a golden age except commercially. Diversity was exciting, but audiences were clear what they wanted, and it's no accident that from 1964 to 66, Hammer released The Evil of Frankenstein, The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, and Dracula, Prince of Darkness, reconnecting with their gothic base. Michael Carreras had now left the company, unhappy with the single-minded pursuit of horror, although the well-documented distance between himself and his father may have contributed. He would return throughout the 60s as an independent, starting with The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, not just producing, but also directing and writing with Alvin Rakoff under the pseudonym Henry Younger, an in-joke on the pen name John Elder used by Anthony Hines, son of Hammer's other founding father. You cannot run away from the curse of the mummy's tomb. With Dracula and Frankenstein, the conversation was always, how do we make the same story different? Because those characters come from books, we know who they are. And if Frankenstein isn't resurrecting the dead, it's not really Frankenstein. With the mummy, the question became, how do we make a different story with the same basic elements? Despite the influence of stories like Arthur Conan Doyle's Lot 249 and Bram Stoker's Jewel of the Seven Stars, The Mummy has no single source text. The closest equivalent it has is the real-life excavation of Tutankhamun's tomb, and that became the key influence of the two Mummy films Hammer made in the mid-60s. Mummy brought back to life. Say, that would really be something. The initial script certainly went in a different direction, with a 20-foot mummy rampaging in Cairo. More King Kong than King Tut, this idea was deemed too ambitious, although the poster design was retained. But the shadow of Kong remains in one of the characters. Alexander King is very proud to present to you the mummy of the royal prince, Ra Antep reminiscent of Kong's Carl Denham. If you'd only learn to play chess, we could make a fortune. The Money Man is a key element of the Tutankhamun story, through Lord Carnarvon, the most high-profile victim of The Mummy's Curse. Reinventing that character as American showman Alexander King 
bankrolling the expedition for unscientific reasons is the film's masterstroke. Now I'm going to roadshow this mummy throughout the world. That way we'll make 700,000 pounds. Partly because it's new, but also thanks to the casting of comedian Fred Clark. Some of us have got it, and the others ride home in a horse cart. Bringing energy into every scene. Hey, was my friend Phineas T. Barnum said, there's one bored every minute. A character we love to hate. Oh, nothing sacrilegious about making money. But a very well-rounded one. Get a good night's sleep. His death is one of the most memorable scenes. <laughs> Though it comes too soon and the film struggles without him. Again, it's the memorable set pieces and strong characters that define Hammer's mummy films. Mention should be made of Jack Willem as disgraced archaeologist Sir Giles. And whoever heard of an Egyptologist who wasn't allowed into Egypt? The lead couple are less engaging. You know, the only real physical danger you may be in is not from the mummy, but from me. Ronald Howard and Jean Roland have no chemistry, made worse by a 20-year age gap and Hammer's irritating habit of dubbing certain actors. When we get back to Paris, I will let you. The lack of chemistry does play into the love triangle when they meet Terence Morgan's charismatic Adam Beecham. <laughs> Please let me introduce Adam Beecham, John Bray. But he's obviously up to no good. Was it found amongst the treasures of the tomb? But... Well, was it? No. As for the mummy himself, Dickie Owen is not Christopher Lee, and Ra and Tef lacks the presence of Karis. On the other hand, Owen is very good in his other role. Be quiet, William. You've got more tongue than anyone's got it's trunk. Not, the film lacks the grey areas of the original, mostly reverting to savage foreigners. It is not our way to be disrespectful to the dead. I know all about your ways. That said, George Pastel returns as Hashmi Bay. Presumably no relation, and a very different and sympathetic character who does not deserve his brutal death. Seven other people in the room, not one tries to help. So our theory was proved right, Inspector. The plot, about two pharaonic brothers whose violent feud cannot be stopped by mere death, is a little muddled by the end. Destroy the last of the desecrators. <laughs> but again, it's different. Carreras' film is strong on razzmatazz. <laughs> with some imaginatively composed transitions. <laughs> while dialing back on the horror. You, uh, you ever learn to do that to ragtime? Give me a call. We'll make a fortune. We're way past the halfway point before the mummy even moves. Awake, Ra, prince of the desert. No! Still, with strong set pieces, an unexpected twist, and Fred Clark... You have enemies, Miss King? Of course I've got enemies. I'm in show business. The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb proved a highly entertaining supporting feature to the Gorgon. Which reunited Cushing and Lee for the first time since The Mummy. It also proved that a mummy film could cover new ground. Invoking their blessings in the years to come, tragedy was already preparing to intrude. Coming three years later, The Mummy's Shroud opens with its flashback, telling the story of a young prince ousted from his kingdom in somewhat clunky fashion. Prim, take cattle Take you, take you! After wandering the desert, Prince Carter Bay is laid to rest by his servant, Prem. As he lay dying, Carter Bay presented to Prem the royal seal of the pharaohs. The seal, also used in the last film, 
is based on a genuine artifact called the Nama Palette. Prem was played by Dickie Owen, the mummy in the last film, but when we jump ahead to 1920, the man in the bandages is Christopher Lee's regular stunt double, Eddie Powell. His distinctive wrappings inspired by a mummy in the British Museum. This is the film most based on a curse, as Prem wreaks bloody vengeance on the desecrators of his master's tomb. He says that death awaits all who disturb the resting place of Carto Bay. Andre Morel is top billed as archaeologist Sir Basil Walden, but this is an ensemble piece, as befits what is essentially a slasher. And as with most slashers, some people are asking for it. What are those men doing over there? Tell them to start unloading the equipment. Played with relish by John Phillips, Stanley Preston is another dislikable money man. Make it quite clear that without Stanley Preston, this expedition would never have got started. Estranged from his archaeologist son, Paul. I have to remind you that you're talking to your father. Unusually for Hammer, there are also strong female character roles. Preston's wife, Barbara, played with dry wit by Elizabeth Sellers. But I don't really think you need concern yourself on my account. You see, I did not enter the tomb. And the cackling fortune teller, Haiti. You mean I'm going to die? <laughs> In a few minutes from now. <laughs> Catherine Lacey of Michael Reeves' The Sorcerers. Her son, whose turn it is to resurrect the mummy, is played by the ever-watchable Roger Delgado. The casting of specific ethnicities is, as always, of its time, and Hasmid is not the nicest stereotype. Some balance, however, is provided by Richard Warner's Inspector Barani. Intelligent, witty, and a well-rounded character. Now don't for a moment look on this as a bribe, will you? I am trying very hard not to. But for Hammer fans, this is the one with Michael Ripper. Is there anything I can get for you, Mrs. Preston? Yes, you can order me some beer. Make sure it's cold. Very good, sir. Hammer's most prolific bit player had been in the previous two films, with varying degrees of success. But here he gets a larger role as downtrodden secretary Longbarrow, and Ripper grasped the opportunity, making every moment count. Twice, I had to hold them at gunpoint. Turning the obsequious yes man into an achingly sympathetic character. Are you no longer going to take me with you, sir? No. Oh. Paul, how can we help him? The male and female leads are underwritten, although linguist Claire does get to play an important role as the only one who can read the words that stop the mummy. Say the words. Enter, I'll basil, I'll human, I'll anticum. Which didn't stop publicity from showcasing actress Maggie Kimberly spilling out of a nightdress. Neither scene nor costume appear in the film. But I thought I'd spare her the ordeal of coming with us. The large cast and the fact this is set entirely in Egypt and predominantly within a grand hotel gives it the feel of an Agatha Christie mystery. I understand Sir Basil Walden has been taken ill, Mr Preston. Can you tell us the nature of his illness? But also links it to Tutankhamun. The film is set only two years prior to that tomb's discovery. <laughs> Sir Basil becomes ill after being bitten by a snake probably a reference to the mosquito bite which killed Lord Carnarvon. Harry, got your camera ready? Uh, oh, already, sir. I want the photograph. And the character of photographer Harry Newton is likely based on Harry Burton, who photographed the Boy King's tomb. Director John Gilling had a long association with Hammer, notably on the Cornish duo of The Reptile and The Plague of the Zombies. But he had a history of clashing with management, and pretty much everyone. This would be his last film for the company, and not one of which he was proud, later saying he did it strictly for the money. Yet, his desire to not just rehash the earlier films is evident. Prem does not crash through doors. Gilling and cinematographer Arthur Grant finding ways to make his approaches visually interesting, reflections. 
or distorted by Longbarrow's poor eyesight. <laughs> while each victim is killed differently. <laughs> Finding creativity within the formula, particularly in Prem's death. Although the flashback is affected by budget, and the desert sequences, all shot in one day at Gerard's Cross gravel pits, give the impression that the desert has changed little over the millennia, there is so much that is enjoyable about the mummy's shroud that it's a shame it falls short of greatness. I can't argue with the various criticisms of it, but it's one I'm personally very fond of. The film marked the end of an era for Hammer, their last shot at Bray Studios, the company's home since 1951's Cloudburst. Coincidentally, the only other Hammer film in which Elizabeth Sellers appeared. It's also the only Hammer Mummy film in which Michael Carreras was not involved, busy with other exotic adventures. But could his relationship with his father have inspired the characters? Three cheers for Piston! Give him a knighthood! Kick off! James Carreras' knighthood was still three years away, but it's tempting to wonder. And all Hammer's Mummy films feature father-son relationships, except the last, which changes son to daughter. Is it true that a curse might fall on members of the expedition? Only four years separate the Mummy's shroud from Hammer's final venture, into Egyptian history, yet you can feel the seismic shift in culture and in Hammer's world. Ah! OK, show us your sarcophagus. After losing their American finance, desperation began to creep into the pictures, trying to keep pace with changing times. These two events were more than a coincidence. In the thick of this, supervising producer Anthony Hines resigned, leaving a void at the top. And so, in 1971, Michael Carreras returned to Hammer as managing director. His first film in charge would be Blood from the Mummy's Tomb. Look! I know. The film is the first cinematic adaptation of Bram Stoker's novel, Jewel of the Seven Stars. Unlike the cinematic mummy, literary mummies tended to be female, seducing their male discoverers. Aspiring producer Howard Brandy and screenwriter Christopher Wicking pitched a mummy film in which the shambling creature in bandages would be replaced by a beautiful semi-naked woman. James Carreras, now Sir James, liked the sound of that, but insisted that the title be changed. Pre-production art shows the direction they had in mind, and Wicking's first draft included a coven of naked acolytes torn apart by a cat spirit, followed by a sex scene amongst the corpses. For the first time, a lead actor was returning to the series as Peter Cushing was cast as archaeologist Julian Fuchs, with the eye-catching role of his daughter Margaret going to the eye-catching Valerie Leon. Just one whiff drives women wild. Its sultry oriental aroma makes men irresistible. Best known for a series of aftershave adverts. And another victim of Hammer dubbing. Sometimes I think there are only two things you want me for. The stage was set for a film designed to reinvigorate Hammer's series and bring Stoker's book into the present. But things did not go as planned. <coughs> the unexpected death of Peter Cushing's wife robbed the film of its star, leaving Michael Carreras one week into his new job facing a crisis. He called Hammer regular Andrew Keir, who agreed to step in on short notice, learning the role over a weekend. But five weeks into shooting, director Seth Holt suffered a fatal heart attack. Don't worry, don't worry. Carrera stepped in to finish the film, but on watching Holt's footage was shocked to discover glaring omissions in key scenes. Exactly what Holt, an experienced director, had in mind is still unclear, and it's possible that he was sicker than anyone realised. His funeral took place a few days before production wrapped, Hammer lending a horse-drawn hearse from the Dracula films. 
Given the circumstances of its making, Blood from the Mummy's Tomb holds up surprisingly well, with only the car crash obviously showing the confusion of Holt's leftover footage. Reviews were untypically generous, reflecting the tragedy and a growing nostalgia for Hammer, now in the mainstream enough that the film premiered as part of a retrospective at the National Film Theatre. But there are genuine reasons for praise. This is the most successful of Hammer's efforts to marry their gothic style to a more contemporary setting. Rather than the cringy attempts to be hip that would mar the following year's Dracula AD 1972, the film connects Egyptian magic to fashionable New Age thinking. An astral body with a free will. While the flashback is a dream, almost a trip, before a very well-staged ritual. Also a dream is the expedition in which the impossibly well-preserved body of Princess Terra is discovered, blood still oozing from her severed wrist. As the sarcophagus is opened back in England, <coughs> this is unquestionably a reincarnated princess, but with a horror twist rather than the usual romance. Are you feeling better now? Terra is not just another thankless hammer heroine. She is the major threat. Oh, no, 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 no. So Leon's Margaret is lead, love interest and monster. Come. as well as the focus of all publicity. Margaret's boyfriend, splendidly named Todd Browning and played by Mark Edwards, has more presence than previous heroes, largely because the plot gives him license to be an ass. And you're going crazy. Come on. Let me go. Come on before it's too late. <laughs> and there are fine supporting roles for veteran George Kouloris, who had appeared in everything from Doctor Who to Citizen Kane, Rosalie Crutchley, no, don't. and James Villiers in the nominal bad guy role, usually filled by an Egyptian priest. Well, the meek shall not inherit the earth. They wouldn't know what to do with it. The set pieces, too, are in place. Once again, there is a series of murders, but here committed by the supernatural animal attendants of terror. <laughs> It's not all good. More accurately, it's not all it could have been. The plot is intriguing, but Wicking's script fails to properly dramatise it, falling back on explanatory dialogue. You know who I am. The emphasis on ancient magic rather than a curse should have been an opportunity, but is nullified by wordy explanation. You died when your mother died, and suddenly you were alive. She is you. Oh. As though willing her body, as though preparing for some abstract metaphysical state. The very thing that makes this film different seems to have been an inconvenience to its makers. There are two unanswered questions. Why, when discovering what would seem to be a freshly killed body in the basement, does Margaret never question what it's doing there? using her as a guinea pig, as an experiment. Why is the Doctor such a gleefully malevolent character? <laughs> and how far does Margaret run in her nightdress from her London home to wind up here? Though a missed opportunity, Blood from the Mummy's Tomb is still an entertaining horror and one of the most original mummy films ever made. It is the culmination of Hammer's cycle, a completely new take on the cinematic mummy.
With Michael Carreras, now chief executive, Hammer surely would have returned to the mummy had events not overtaken them. But what you call the truth is lies. In 1972, Michael learned that Sir James had offered Hammer for sale without bothering to tell his son. Furious, Michael put in an offer of his own, which Sir James accepted. But the gambit failed. The company would limp on until 1979's The Lady Vanishes, but was effectively done by the middle of the decade. Carreras later said, looking back now, I should have walked away. It was too emotional. For many, that sad end is Michael Carreras' legacy, but it really ought to be the Mummy franchise and its Egyptian razzmatazz. The series is unlike virtually any other horror franchise, and perhaps there is a lesson that constant reinvention is better than dragging a weight of mythology and backstory behind you. There is a sort of Venn diagram of elements that the films share. Period flashbacks, archaeological investigations, all of them. Wise Mentor versus Villainous Money Man, all but the first. If people want to be educated, I'll educate them at 10 cents a time. The Curse, all but the last. Severed Hands, two and four. Feuding Brothers, two and three. Fortune Tellers, three and four. Bloody Murders, comedy working class. In our lens, come on, come on. Michael Ripper. And yet, each entry feels like its own thing. I'm not sure I'd put any of them, even the first in Hammer's top five, but they are all enjoyable. An irresistible blend of horror, <laughs> history, Child of exotic mysticism, and old-fashioned adventure. Which, from Boris Karloff to Brendan Fraser, is what The Mummy does best. Thanks for watching and particular thanks to our Patreon supporters without whom we could not make these longer specials. How do you rank the Hammer Mummy films and why? Let us know in the comments below.